uh, of all the regions, this is definitely one that I would say I know the best. Uh, why do I know it the best? Because I lived there. I lived in Dixie for, uh, for, uh, for about four or five years, and all I did was study the American South. Uh, so I studied in case I studied in uh, I studied Appalachia, I studied North Carolina, I studied Louisiana, and so this is an area in which I know uh, quite well. Uh, and so when we look at this whole Dixie area, we begin by looking at the physical environment uh, and also the uh, human environment, uh, the populating of this particular area. Just like we did with the great, or sorry, just like we did with the bread basket, we're going to break down uh, the Dixie region into two specific uh, uh, subregions. Uh, and as you'll find out, these are very clear as far as why they are separated. They're clear physically, but they're also clear uh, culturally as well. Uh, and so those two areas we're going to further uh, talk about. But first off, let's go back to our topographic profile. And so we can just obviously see that we've got coastline throughout much of Dixie. Uh, and so that coastline res uh, relates to a very flat, a uh, very smooth surface that gently slopes to the ocean, to the coastline, to the gulfs. Uh, but then, of course, we also have the Appalachian Mountains. And so the Appalachian Mountains combine with those other mountain ranges that we learned for, from a previous uh, uh, map quiz, the Ouachita Mountains, those are all more found in the northern part of Dixie, further off from the coast, and so further inland uh, from the coast. And so this area is going to be comprised of two key areas, the Appalachian upland areas, but also the smooth coastal flatland areas in which we find uh, a much different uh, culture there. Uh, and so once again, zooming in, we're going to be focusing in on the Appalachians in this smooth, gentle tra trajectory, smooth slope, till we get to the ocean, to the coastline. And so this is the uh, map quiz one key, if we can recall. And so to denote the, uh, the uh, region that is, the Dix uh, Di that is Dixie, we just essentially, here's the Everglades, so it's above the Everglades, all the way around to Houston, Dallas, around this mountain range, the Wichita Mountains, to St. Louis, to Indy, over, and then back around. Uh, and so we're going to essentially kind of go around this whole uh, uh, little uh, mountain range, and so that's why we learned about it. You know, it's a very obscure mountain range. In fact, it's probably not even a mountain range, but it's got enough of a characteristic for us to work with that we're going to learn about it and apply it. But of course, we've already learned this semester that the Appalachians used to be connected to this mountain range. What separated them? Our good friend, the Mississippi River. Uh, so the Mississippi River has separated what was once one long, big, old, massive uh, mountain chain. Uh, so that separates these two uh, uh, mountain ranges from each other. And so here are our places. Maybe this isn't work, the whole red-blue uh, trance here we got going on. Uh, but we've got the upland south and the lowland south. And so that's the key ways in which we're going to dis dis uh, differentiate uh, Dixie. Uh, we're going to look at it in terms of the upland south, and the lowland south. As you can just kind of just figure out, upland is going to relate to the mountainous areas, the higher elevated areas. Lowland south, flat uh, coastal areas. Uh, and so we're going to see various differences regarding precipitation, temperature, but also ethnicities, voting behavior when we look at the upland south versus the lowland south. Uh, and so we can further zoom in here and differentiate um, uh, more. Uh, someone tell me what the humid subtropical climate region is. Characteristics of it. Wait, yep, that was on the first exam. Is that, is that what you asked? Yeah. Year-round precipitation. Year-round precipitation. Hot, muggy summers. Hot, muggy summers. Hurricane prone. Hurricane prone. And so all of those are attributed to the fact it's right there along the coastline. It is right there smack dab along the Gulf of Mexico. It's right there in sticking out into the Caribbean. So essentially what we've got is we've got rain year round. And so this is going to be an area, especially when you get close to the coast, in which you get a high amount of precipitation. So the closer you are to the coast, you're going to get more rain. Uh, but also with that, you're going to get more moisture. And so the hots are even hotter, hotter and muggier uh, than what they would be further north. Uh, so because of our location, it's extremely humid here, and so thus we've got very dense vegetation. Uh, and so one characteristic of all of the south is you've got fairly dense vegetation from 
very consistently warm and moist conditions. You go up further north to the breadbasket or the foundry, you have more seasonality. You've got those hard freezes. Uh, you've got, you know, what we already, you've got snow in October. Uh, whereas there, it's more of a, of a mild climate in the winter and very, very hot and muggy in the summertime. Uh, but let's go ahead and try to see if we can see some key differences. Uh, what is this? Extreme maximum temperature. Uh, so extreme maximum temperature. Uh, so higher temperatures are orange. Um, so what this is recording is the highest temperature that was recorded from January to December of last year. And so you would think, now if you follow me, pink is warmer than yellow. You would think that the further you go down, it should be warmer. Our good friend the equator is way down there. Uh, but what this is, is once again the role of coast, the role of water, as far as moderating temperature along the water body or along coastlines, the hots don't get as hot, but the colds don't get as cold. Similarly, we talked about last week, or three weeks ago, when we talked about the breadbasket. The further inland we would go, the higher temperatures we would find. And so the deeper you are within the continent, you're going to actually find warmer temperatures. Um, and that's because there's no moderating influences of a water body. Waters do, water bodies do a good job of keeping places the climate for, or the temperature from not going as high or not going as low. And so in the summer, the temperatures don't get as high. Don't believe me. Key West, all summer long, the high temperature, 87 degrees, 88 degrees, 90 degrees. Indiana, we had what, weeks within the weather was in the 90s for the, for the entire week, for multiple weeks. They, are, they, never even, they barely even scratched 90. Why? They're sticking out in the middle of a water body. So water bodies do a good job of kind of keeping the temperatures from going up and down uh, throughout the year uh, uh, considerably. Further, uh, more ways we can look at this is regarding the uh, minimum temperature. Uh, and so the minimum temperature. Now we can really see the closer you are to a coastline, uh, the warmer you are. Uh, so here we can see the, far, the fact that the teal, or sorry, the aqua, uh, is south of the blue. And so, once again, the idea here, when you go up in elevation, temperature goes down. Um, so as you climb a mountain, uh, temperature should go down as you get higher and higher and higher. Now, the opposite of that, when you go down a mountain, the temperature should get warmer. Uh, and one way to showcase this, when I went to the Smokies on 4th of July, went to the Smokies and I got to the top, the very much the, the highest point you can go in the Smokies, and I had to put on a coat. This is 4th of July in Dixie. Uh, so we see the role of elevation as far as uh, keeping places cooler, um, for sure. All right, now we talk about cultural things. All right, so try to wrap your mind around this here. Uh, what this is, is this is from the 2008 election. So if we can go back to the 2008 election. Uh, so what this is, is comparing results from 2004. Uh, so if from 2004 to 2008, your area became more Republican, so less likely to vote for Obama in 2008 than you're red. If, you're, if your state or your country, or your, sorry, if your county or place was more likely to go Democrat, like the entire country did, keep in mind, we went from Bush in 04 to Obama in 08. Uh, if you went the other way, you're blue. What do we notice? We notice blue throughout here, the lowland south, but then we see the upland south, we have this red. And so we're going to see voting behaviors that differentiate upland south from lowland south. And so not only do we see temperature differences, elevation differences, uh, but also we're starting to see cultural differences. In this case, upland south voting more Republican and lowland south voting more Democrat. Uh, that's another thing that's pretty much uh, characteristic of, uh, of, of all voting in this particular area. Upland south much more conservative than the lowland south. <clears throat> all right. Uh, and so, yeah, no, question, no. All right, so we talked about this beforehand. Uh, and so this is another way to visualize, once again, uh, the role of the most recent glacier advance. And so we have a massive sheet of ice. All that water has to go somewhere. All that water goes and drains right through the Mississippi, which then separates the two mountain ranges from each other, creating these two separate upland areas. Uh, and so I'm going to focus in today just on the upland south. Uh, so I'm going to focus in on the areas of the Appalachia and the Wichita Mountains 
uh, that have a much different characteristic than the lowland south. Next Friday, I'll come back and I'll hit in the lowland south before uh, our map quiz three. All right, where's that damn remote? There it is. All right, so where are we at now? Moving right along. So here is the upland south. Uh, and so within the upland south, I'm going to talk about three different, uh, three different regions. Uh, and so each of these, if we're starting to develop a key term list, each of these are a key term uh, as well. Uh, and so I try to also use a lot of more key terms uh, in the, uh, the discussion and kind of put them in here and say, hey, this is a key term, uh, kind of a, uh, I guess, a, a siren, so to speak. Put my fingernails. What a poorly designed thing. I have fingernails. I got it. Remotes are sexist. <laughs> go through uh, each of these individual uh, sub-regions of the Upland South. Uh, so, uh, kind of a quick 411 on the Upland South. Uh, so the Upland South, the Southern Appalachians, kind of the region around it. Uh, you know, one of the things is we're, I'm using this to, uh, to kind of, okay, this is, wherever, this is where we're at, this is what we're looking at, but I'm also using this to showcase some ideas. The Southern Appalachians, notice the boundary line of it. It goes from Birmingham, to Atlanta, to Charlotte, to Greensboro, to Richmond. What do we got going on here? Notice these cities, kind of. Exactly, we got break and bulk cities. And so the break and bulk city idea comes back right here. And it makes sense. You know, you look at where these are located. Birmingham, major, major manufacturing area, shipping. Atlanta, uh, Atlanta, we know it's big, but railroad's been critical. Charlotte, same idea. I think it's like the, Queen, the Queens River, maybe. Uh, works its way up there, uh, or the French Broad River, maybe I don't know. Uh, the Greensboro. So you got these rivers that essentially they get to the point in which they the slope becomes much deeper, and then our cities start to populate. So we can clearly define the Southern Appalachian and the Appalachian, especially on that one side, the eastern side. Uh, and so next time I'm going to come back and kind of tie in um, some some things that happen in the Appalachian area with things that happen over here, and so kind of tie in. Uh, these, this, this line a little bit clearer. Um, further, we got the uh, the uh, you know Nashville, Lexington, uh, even Indianapolis, uh, and so you could say Columbus, Indiana, Bloomington would be part of this interior low plateau. And I'm going to come in a little bit later and further describe this, uh, but the kind of the common characteristic here is it's not so much mountainous area, uh, it's not a lot of agricultural area right through here. It's very rugged. A lot of hills and such, not like the flat, uh, flat terrain we'd see over here in the breadbasket. Uh, but if you want to go caving in the United States, uh, this is one of the best areas in the world to go caving. Uh, so key to understanding this is this: there's no glaciers have ever been in this area, and it's also not mountains. Uh, so those are two key reasons why we see a lot of caves in this area. Not really going to go into explaining caves. Uh, but then over here, you've got the Wichita Mountains. Uh, this Wichita is this area here throughout Arkansas, even parts of Oklahoma. Uh, and this kind of this whole rugged area uh, then goes to our good friend Dallas. Uh, so this here is then the Ozarks. Uh, so St. Louis to Indianapolis. And so this is generally uh, what we refer to as the Upland South. Uh, so defined, defined by three separate uh, individual regions. All right. Uh, so we talked about the drainage. Uh, the drainage in this particular uh, area, uh, the drainage on the one side of the Appalachian Mountains, everything drains this way. Uh, whereas on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, everything drains that way towards the Atlantic Ocean. And so much of Dixie over here drains to the coastal plain, to the Gulf Coast, uh, whereas over here uh, we're going to see more of a drainage to uh, the coast. I'll come back and really hit that a little bit harder in the lowland south because it's a little bit more important there for them because they deal uh, with all those rivers coming through there. 
Uh, so this is going to be what I'm not going to talk about this area today, uh, but this is going to be another area, another region within uh, Dixie that uh, we'll talk about next time uh, when we talk about the lowland south. Uh, so here, this area, very flat, uh, with an American population, and a much different characteristic overall than the upland south. Uh, and so then we'll talk about all the beaches and all the good stuff here, the carnies, the meth heads. Actually, meth heads we'll talk about today. All right, now it's the focal point of this discussion here. Uh, so today we're going to focus in on the Upland South, and I'm going to spend a good amount of time on Appalachia. So we'll do we'll do Appalachia for a good 20 minutes, and then maybe take a want to take a break now or later. Later. So we'll do the Appalachians now, and then we'll do a break right after that. All right, Appalachia. Uh, and so we talk about Appalachia, kind of the things that we know of. We know it's poor. Uh, we know it's, it's, it's not an area in which a lot of people move to. Uh, but one of the things, this is an area that's slowly starting to change. Uh, but it hasn't changed much at all in a long, long time. So we got these two key questions that I'm going to ask. And they're kind of really not questions. You can Google them, and you're probably going to find answers to these questions. Uh, but I feel like the answers to these questions will be able to use the following lecture information to explain why we see this particular pattern in which more biodiversity exists, exists in Appalachia. And so a key term, biodiversity. What is biodiversity? I'll ask the question to the audience. What is, the, what is biodiversity? What do you think it is? It's having lots of different types of eco life as well as animals. Lots of different plants and animals. Exactly. So there's a plethora uh, of plants and animals. And so there's a large variety of plants and animals here. Uh, you go to the bread basket, not much variety. You got your prairie dogs, you got some deer, uh, you got, uh, I don't know what else you got, some buffalo. You don't have much variety. Uh, whereas in the forested areas the, the, uh, of Appalachia, you're going to come across all kinds of snakes and lizards and, uh, and you know various cats and bobcats and all kinds of various things in, in, uh, in southern Appalachia. What's that? Oh. That I heard another animal critter being mentioned. Uh, so we're trying to figure out why. What are three reasons why there's more biodiversity in southern Appalachia than other regions? Before I get there, let me see if you have any ideas. Why do you think there's more biodiversity? I could be wrong, but the when the glaciers came through, since they met, they didn't go that far when they were pushing the animals and they were running from it. They all ended up there, and the mountains stopped them. <laughs> well, that makes sense, right? That makes sense. I don't know, but it, does. it could be a nice thing. Like that is reason number one. You're exactly correct. <laughs> reason number one. Um, so it, actually, it's in my list of reasons, reason number three. But whatever, they're all reasons. They're, they're, they're in particular order. Uh, is the fact that we got the glacier, that glacier advance. And so that glacier advance I talked about beforehand. So the glacier advance moved. And so 12 to 13,000 years ago, that glacier stopped moving. And so essentially, as it moves, we're talking, a, you know, up in places, a, you know, a thousand feet uh, from the surface up to the top of this ice sheet. Obviously, critters, they kind of got to move. This ice sheet's going to move them. And so over time, more plants, uh, but animals also have migrated because of that glacial advance. And they, as the glacier then headed back, they just stuck around. And so one key reason is the biodiversity has been pushed from other areas due to the glacial advance and it stopped and then left behind those critters and those plants and all those various things, fungi, bacteria, this, that, and the other uh, in this area. <clears throat> so that's one reason. Um, I know from experience that going into the south, the bugs get gradually bigger the further down you go, so my guess is that it's a good climate for things to grow. Okay. Climate. Um, yeah, it's just like the warmer it gets, the more that's going to flourish there. Okay. Um, so uh, the the idea is uh, where it's warmer, more uh, more flourishing. Okay. Okay. So where it's warmer, it's more flourishing. So uh, kind of the idea is temperature. Come back to that idea. 
Is it because, since it's like a mountain, and there's different climates in the sections of the mountain, so there's colder things that would live up at the top, and then the warmer, like the medium temperature things would live in the middle, and then at the bottom you have the little things that can't climb to the top of the mountain? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so in, in this particular area, not only do we have warmer conditions, especially at the bottom, and so we've got what Gwen was talking about, those warm, moist conditions. And so there's a, a bevy of stuff that grows down here in the lowland areas. But then when you change elevation, you change vegetation type. And so going back to my trip to the Great Smoky Mountains, when I went to the top, at the top, there are no deciduous trees. There are no deciduous trees. Everything is pine. Everything is evergreens. Uh, and so everything is evergreens and for the most part. Uh, whereas down here, you get more of the deciduous trees. Uh, and so that's why actually, you know, much of the Smokies is pine, which is why Nashville, Indiana is probably a better place to go to watch leaves change colors uh, because these are not really losing their leaves at all that much. Uh, but here, at least nonetheless, in the mountains, you're going to find a variety of environments. This is really played out in the tropical areas. In fact, you can go to Latin America, and at the top of the peaks in Latin America, you can find snow. Uh, so a highland area's elevation change is going to have a variety of environments. Hawaii has a snow-capped mountain. I kid you not, Hawaii as a snow-capped mountain. So you can just imagine the variety of life. You know, some things that like the tropical climate, and other things that like a much uh, cooler climate. Uh, and so that is another key reason. So our second reason is related to climate. So we might even have to do lectures. This is great. Just ask questions, we'll answer them. This could be completely random, but would it be because of all the different types of, like, settlers? Because usually settlers bring over different types of plants and vegetables that are native. So you had the Dutch who came over, you also had the Spanish for a while, and then the French as well in different parts. And it's a break and bulk cities there. Too. Well, not that so much in Appalachia. Oh, not Appalachia's not. the other side of those break and bulk yeah. cities. Um, let's take the whole idea of people for our third reason. Uh, and so we've got people migrating. Uh, and so you've mentioned all these types of peoples, the Dutch, the Germans, the, or the, the Dutch I think are the Germans, the Pennsylvania Dutch and Germans are the same, uh, the, the French, the English, whoever. Um, when they migrated to the United States, uh, they originally went to the foundry. Uh, if they didn't find what they liked in the foundry, then they headed out to the breadbasket. If they didn't like it, then they headed out to, uh, to the west coast. Essentially, Appalachia is an area where people never really settle, in which you don't see a large amount of population living here. And so these are going to be areas, this particular area, this particular part of the country is, hasn't really been influenced too much by human beings. Now, no doubt there, it has. There's been a lot of forest, forest loss. There's, no, there's been a lot of change to the human environment, or sorry, the, the physical environment. Uh, but uh, the lack of people populating this area and then altering it via our agriculture is our main way to a alter things or industrialize areas, it's pretty much been left alone. And so kind of the lack of population gain, the lack of people coming in here to disturb things, uh, we can almost say the isolation uh, of this area uh, from people. And so our three reasons, uh, because of the glacial advance, which then pushed a lot of various things that would normally not be native to that area to Southern Appalachia, the role of the very climate and weather characteristics, and so you're going to have various uh, uh, climate and vegetation uh, there. Uh, and our third reason, the fact that it wasn't really influenced by humans, and so humans didn't really alter and remove biodiversity from a particular area. And so all this here, oh yeah, so all this, we'll, we'll, we'll explain these things as we go through here. Next up. Um, if you can remember the ways in which we can make it rain. I don't know if you do, uh, but do you remember this way? With the cloud. Yeah. With the cloud? Okay, great. Uh, so, orographic precipitation. So, uh, whenever you see something like this, it's a key term. Uh, so, that's the new thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have key terms clearly shown. And so, orographic precipitation. Uh, and so, what we're doing is we're trying to understand why we have a particular pattern here. And that particular pattern that I notice is we've got the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains come right through here, right? Uh, and so the Appalachian Mountains, we've got kind of this warm, moist condition. Blue means more rain. But then over here, on the other side, it's, it's a little bit drier. And so we're trying to figure out why we have rain over here, precipitation on one side of the Appalachians, 
and then less precipitation on the other side of the, uh, the Appalachians. And the key thing to grasp here is our weather, for the most part, goes this way. Our weather goes from west to east. Uh, and so especially from down here, things come up from the south and from the west. That's why the lovely Angela Buckman, she's back on the air, although she's not as good as she used to be. Anyway, she always is looking over here when she's describing what our forecast in Indiana is going to be going forward because weather moves west to east. And so if we go back, we're trying to figure out why on the west side of the Appalachians it's wet and on the east side it's dry. And so we go back to our good friend orographic precipitation. So I have a warm, moist air mass. Now, how do I get a warm, moist air mass in this particular area of the country? Once again, look what we have here. We've got a big old Gulf of Mexico. And that Gulf of Mexico supplies a lot of warm, moist air that gets kind of forced up right to the Appalachians, right up the western side of the Appalachians. And so what ends up happening is we get a little bit of that warm, moist air rising. If we can get warm, moist air to rise, eventually it's going to get to a cooler place. It's going to get a higher elevation. It's going to cool, condense, and fall back down as rain. And so subsequently, we get some sides of the mountains that get a ton of rain, but that air continues on. It continues to push on to the east, and as it pushes on, it essentially spews all of its precipitation, spews all of its moisture. And so the Smoky Mountains are right smack dab, right in the middle of this area right through here. Uh, and so the Smoky Mountains, and you can see that gray right through here, a good amount of rain. Uh, and so the Smoky Mountains, they're smoky, not because there's a lot of fires there, not because there's a lot of people smoking cigarettes, not because there's a lot of people starting fires there. They're smoky because they appear smoky because there's always a mist, especially at the top of the Smoky Mountains. That mist is essentially, wrong way, is essentially orographic precipitation. Warm, moist air, eventually, it's, you don't see it when you're there at the bottom of the mountain, but when you go to the top, you can actually see that warm, moist air rise and actually clouds form, and that clouds form provide this mist that constantly hovers at the top of the Smoky Mountains, uh, which gives them that name of the Smoky Mountains because of that mist. It's not smoke, it's, uh, it's kind of a, uh, a haze. Next up is Ridge and Valley. All right, so if we think about this particular area, uh, so this particular area, let's see if we can do it with, exam, uh, with this here. So the Appalachian Mountains, they formed, uh, they formed a long, long time ago. Uh, so they're very old mountains. And so when they formed, you had Africa on one side, North America on the other. And so they're essentially they're pushing into each other. And so when they pushed into each other, they created this rugged topography in which when they pushed in, what do we notice? Kind of these ridges and valleys that form. So I push in on both sides, I've now formed two ridges in a valley. Yeah, that's it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, so, uh, yeah. and so essentially I created from just simple plate tectonics, plate tectonics, I created a ridge and valley characteristic. And we're going to see that ridge and valley very clearly when we do some Google mapping. All right, so imagine here, we've got a lot of rain. Uh, so we talked about this area having a lot of precipitation uh, because uh, of the various reasons I mentioned. Uh, so eventually what happens is this precipitation falls. And when it falls, where is it going to collect? It's going to collect in the valleys. Uh, and so the valleys of this ridge and valley complex is the, pretty much the only place we're going to find any settlement. So in southern Appalachia, the only settlement, the only towns and cities are pretty much found in the valleys. And that makes sense. It's way too rugged. The topography is way too rough. Here you actually have a water source. Here it's actually flatter. Uh, you can actually build buildings. Uh, you can actually dig down and get a you know, foundation, where here the steep slopes prevent that. And so the valleys of the Ridge and Valley complex within southern Appalachia is where much of the settlement uh, over time has been focused. So Ridge and Valley. Let's see if we can see the Ridge and Valley. This probably won't work. Good? Yeah, we're not listening to sports talk anymore. Come on now. All right. Where are we going? 
I forget what we're doing. Ridge and oh, Ridge and Valley, Ridge and Valley. All right, Ridge and Valley. My bad. Ridge and Valley, Ridge and Valley. Where are we at? Oh, okay, that's why. All right. <laughs> Let's see if we can see this Ridge and Valley. I think we can definitely see that ridge and valley. So here are the ridges and then the valleys. Uh, so you can kind of see how these little towns are there more, more in the valleys. Let's go to see how Stone Valley, Harrisonburg Valley. Uh, so you can kind of see this ridge and valley complex, how you have these linear, see how they're kind of linear? Do we agree? Do we see this? Linear? No? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good deal. And so this whole linear thing plays a key role in the settlement pattern that occurred here in Appalachia. And so you essentially have these, these long barriers, these long thin barriers that prevent you from going this way. And so one of the things you'll note in this whole Ridge and Valley complex is some particular patterns. And so capital of Pennsylvania is... Harrisburg. Now I know the names aren't the same. Harrisonburg, Harrisburg, fairly similar, but it makes sense. The people that migrated from here essentially went down this path. Of course, the interstate wasn't there, but they came down this path and they went into Harrisonburg. And so you see a particular pattern in which people who migrate, they can't go across um, because of the, 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 the terrain. You can't go, you can't take your horse and buggy up over a mountain. And so essentially you move and you wherever you've got a gap. And so here might be a gap. And so you can squeeze through there and go to the next Ridge and Valley complex. And so essentially what you have is you have this pattern of settlement in which it moved down through the Ridge and Valley, not across. It's a very key idea. And so the settlement of this particular area of Southern Appalachia actually begins from people leaving this area through here and moving on down. Now this particular people and groups that moved down were three particular groups. Uh, two big ones, uh, but three particular groups. Those groups, Germans, Scots-Irish, and English. And that makes sense. In Pennsylvania, in the early origins of the foundry, the reason why I talked about the Pennsylvania Dutch is the Pennsylvania Dutch then came and then migrated to the south as well. And they would do, is they would go use the whole rigid valley, kind of, they'd go down and around, wherever they got a gap, kind of fill it in, go wherever they could uh, to get wherever they're headed to. Uh, headed to. Uh, another key group, Scots-Irish. Um, do Scots-Irish like to drink? Yes. You bet your bottom dollar they like to drink. They like to drink whiskey too. They like the hard stuff. They like it to be as about as potent as possible. We're gonna come back to those guys, or gals and also the English. Uh, and so we look at this area today, actually I'll, I'll be quiet. Uh, so 1700s, 1800s, uh, much of the people who populated Appalachia, of course, I'm not talking about American Indians, I apologize, Native Americans, uh, we're talking about the uh, more recent. Uh, so that group that populated German, Scott-Irish, and English. I tie this in to moonshine here in a minute. Um, this is that population map, and I'm really not trying to get us to figure out too much. Once again, the ID here, though, is this shows a dot for people. And it really doesn't try to map areas. Yeah, we got the state lines here, maybe a place name, but it, we should not see the ridge and valleys actually on here. But we do when we look at people. And you can kind of see this whole how linear pattern. I'm hoping we're seeing that. Uh, and so that also roughly corresponds to the whole ridge and valley idea. Maybe if I zoom in, can we see a little better? And I see how there's very much this in a line here, and another line. And so I can bet your bottom dollar that ridge goes right through there. It does. All right. Now let's do the Cumberland Gap. Uh, so the Cumberland Gap, it's actually only about five hours from here. Uh, and I would think it's, it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, in my life. All right. All right, so Cumberland Gap. So the problem I mentioned earlier, it was everyone, if you wanted to head west, it was quite difficult to do it through Appalachia. And so you had to kind of work your way through the ridge and valleys, and so most people just naturally were forced south. But if you wanted to head west, it was very much difficult. 
very tough to do. Then came the finding of the Cumberland Gap. All right, let's go to the Cumberland Gap. I'll take you there. Uh, the Cumberland Gap, uh, this is not an exam question, but uh, uh, Cumberland Gap is found where uh, three states come together. Anybody been there? Three states come together. Those states are Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. There it is. So it's one of those deals where you can stand on a point, they've got a monument, you can stand on one point, you can be in three different states. Uh, so you can be in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. I think uh, there's a few of those out west, there are four states. But anyway, all right. Hopefully with this you can kind of see the ruggedness. All right. Uh oh, no, no, no. All right. Look at this structure here. There is no way you're taking your horse and buggy up over that sucker. There is no way you're moving your family through and up and over uh, this, this uh, rugged uh, terrain here. And you know what? That's the case for a while. And then boom. There's the Cumberland Gap. All right, let's try to figure this out from a... Oh, it's not letting me zoom out. There we go. No terrain. And so right through there is a gap. And so through here, this ridge was continuous, but now a gap slowly, you can actually kind of see this. Now you can actually get through there and head further to the west. What created this gap? What created the Cumberland Gap? A waterway. Rain. Explosives? <laughs> yeah. Was it a moonshine <laughs> accident gone wrong? <laughs> meteor. A meteor. Let, I'll show you. If you kind of zoom out here, look at this town here, this middle borough of town. You can kind of see the impact, the circular impact here. The crater landed right here. You can kind of see this. And so Middlesbrough is in the bowl of an actual meteor strike. And so a meteor, of course, before humans were here, came plowing into this area, and the explosion, the debris, cut through the mountain ridge, creating a gap now. And so it was actually a meteor landing, coming plow, creating a crater. And if you look at it, you know, the scientists have done it. They looked at the, they cored, they went down and cored the soil, and it's just loaded with stuff that's out of this world, literally, literally. Uh, and so they essentially, from that, found out that this crater blew through the open of the Cumberland Gap. So essentially, a meteor opened up westward expansion through this particular area. And this is the Cumberland Gap. So finally, you can then head west after you know just getting stuck there in the Ridge and Valley complex of uh, what you would call it. All right. Um, what is folk? What does that mean? Yeah, sorry. Do they have like an estimated time of when they think it's... I, I bet they do. I, I don't know it for sure. I bet they do. And they probably almost have to within, you know, a few hundred thousand years. I mean, I bet they, they would know almost to a T. Um, but the town that's called like Middlesbrough, Kentucky, I believe. Uh, but Cumberland Gap, uh, a tourist site for sure because of that. All right, what does folk mean? What's folk culture? What is folk? It's, it's the kind of, I don't want to say country culture, but it's the, um, the culture that's sprung up in Dixie and, and the other areas around where um, you know, people drew on their experience and came together and kind of created their own culture as Americans in the 1800s, you know, you've got you know, things like bluegrass music and yeah. it's hard to explain. Dude, Wikipedia, sort of Google Wikipedia folk. Um, anyone else? Folk. Folk music. Folk uh, culture. With, like verbal storytelling, like not, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe a simple definition. Not it's a popular. German noun. It's coming from German. Like that big giant. Wikipedia says it's practiced by oh, small, yeah. homogenous rural groups living relative, isol relatively isolated from other groups of the region. 
boom. That is Appalachia to the T. Uh, so Appalachia is extremely isolated. And so that is one of their biggest burdens, is the fact they're pretty much cut off from the rest of the country. Uh, and so when we think about why do you find folk culture in Appalachia, is what is folk culture? Folk culture is small groups, and typically, the, I, I always, simple definition, stuff that's not popular, stuff that's not mainstream. So this is not where we're going to find Lady Gaga popular. Lady Gaga, I don't know, she's still right, popular? Uh, yeah. um, this is where you're going to find more of a kind of a specific group that is interested in specific things. For instance, bluegrass music. You know, bluegrass music, raise your hand if you like bluegrass music. Uh, of course, now we all like bluegrass music. Is it, is it the hip thing to do? Just like with little mustaches and... <laughs> bluegrass, usually, you know, I ask this question normally, it would be like two people have even heard of bluegrass. Bluegrass is very specific to this area. Pop music, rap music, hip-hop, even country. Pretty much popular everywhere. So folk group usually plays to a very small, select, homogenous, very similar, isolated audience. Uh, so some examples, bluegrass would be one example. Um, uh, you could say moonshine, moonshine drinking. Uh, you know, moonshine drinking, I don't know if you are drinking every weekend. Uh, but my buddies down in Knoxville, Tennessee, they are drinking every weekend. Uh, moonshine, I don't know what that's going to happen with their stomach and their liver, but whatever. Um, and so there, it's very normal. Uh, you know, I was shocked when the first week I moved down there, you know, people open up this jar and it's got a bunch of peaches in it. And so I'm thinking, oh great, they're, they're you know, canning peaches, cool. Uh, but then they open it up and just cleared the room in that. Uh, but that was very normal there. And you know, that's for us here in Indiana, we would never have noticed that. Uh, and so examples of folk culture, uh, there's, a tons, there's tons of them. There's the housing types, sawmill gravy, all kinds of you know, banjos, all kinds of things that are distinctively Appalachia. Uh, but we'll just push on and go to the good stuff. Moonshine. All right, so let's talk about moonshine. What does it, what does it take to, to make moonshine? Uh, and so to make moonshine, uh, it requires two key ingredients. Uh, so to make moonshine, you have to have corn. Uh, and so the key, you know, one way to, uh, uh, anyone know Rocky Top? Rocky Top, Tennessee, the song? I'll, I'll give you, I'll give the whole class five bonus points if you can sing it. That's too many. I'll give you two bonus points if you can sing it. Wait, what are we singing? Rock and top. <laughs> <laughs> but in the line it's saying, where do you get your corn? You get your corn from the jar. Uh, and so that's part of, that's a line from the Rocky Top song, is we get our corn from the jar. Uh, so corn from the jar, that's moonshine. Uh, and so corn is a key ingredient for moonshine. Another key ingredient is fresh water. Uh, so you have to kind of have a constant supply of fresh water. Uh, and so, so the cleaner the water, the better. Uh, and so where you're going to find cleaner water is upslope, uh, where it just, re just recently rained and that water hasn't been gone too far away. So you need two key ingredients, corn and fresh water. But then, you need, other, you need other things. First off, uh, you need to be kind of down and out on your luck. Uh, and so where do we find moonshine historically and still to this day? We find it in low-income areas, places in which we find more depressed people. Today, methamphetamine, or sorry, uh, crystal meth, meth has now become kind of the new uh, um, um, moonshine. Uh, Oxycontin, in many ways, has become the new uh, meth, or sorry, the new moonshine today. Um, so you need this kind of this low income, down and out, not much to do, not much going on, plus corn, plus fresh water, but then you have to keep it away from the cops. Uh, and so because these rugged terrain and remote, very isolated area of the country, it's easy to hide your moonshine still from the cops, the authorities, whoever would be interested in not letting you do uh, your moonshine, uh, your moonshine still. Now we're going to tie this into NASCAR next time. Uh, so I'm talking about moonshine now because it relates to the origins of NASCAR, which became more popular in the lowland south uh, later on. All right, uh, let's take a break here. That's a, that's a nice one. Yeah, take a break here. And so our first one is uh, the fact this area wasn't settled. Would be another reason, maybe. Hard to settle there. 
Yeah. I was going to say, because my mom is, was actually a census worker, and one of the things that they got was that it was very difficult for outside people to move in. So if anyone, if anyone did find a reason to move there, it was very difficult for them to be acquainted and get connected in the area because there was a very, this is us, we don't really want a lot of outsiders. Yeah, uh, lots of horror stories about census people going in here trying to collect data and, yeah. and you know, it's so, so backward, so remote where, you know, they might not make it out of there. She had to bring a sheriff with her. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's that kind of speaks to this remoteness. and. Uh, you know, we don't really ever think about a census taker having a, you know, a perilous uh, you know, journey through Appalachia here, just collecting data. <laughs> yeah. um, why Philadelphia? Why Baltimore? Why New York? Why Chicago? Why Cleveland? Why Detroit? Waterways. waterways, bing, 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 bing. Uh, coastlines. And so this is an area where nowhere near a waterway, nowhere near a coastline. You're not going to be able to ship stuff in here, and so there's no jobs here. And so one key reason why this area has remained isolated is there's another reason why it would grow. 